So today we're going to talk about voices from the past, present, and hope for our future. I will begin with sharing some of the quotes from the voices of our past. A nation that continues after year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. And you know, with the national call of moral revival, we're always talking about the soul of this nation and the distorted morality to blame people for their poverty. And that, of course, was quoted by Reverend Dr. King at Riverside Church, and we know that that was one of his last speeches on the war in Vietnam, 1967. Take all, here's another quote, take all the energy you want to burn with, you want to burn with, and look President Johnson in the eye and tell him like a man. Look him in the eye and say, you're going to have to stop the war in Vietnam. Take all the money you were going to spend in Vietnam and spend it in Mississippi and feed us. That was Leon Hall, Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, 1968. The annual meeting today is entitled Resisting War, Poverty, and Racism. And we do agree that it is important, more important than ever, for citizens to stand up and demand an end to militarism and turn from war to peace. However, as we all know as experts, seasoned activists, and impactors, educators, and scientists, that the resistance today is very real to the point where it is palatable. As Jeffrey Sachs was giving us a rundown on the mental capacity of the president and the corrupt Congress, that feeling that you got in your gut is how we feel every day without end. Oh God, in poverty, we can't afford to go on vacations and take a break and go swimming on a wonderful island. We feel this feeling in our gut every single day. As a matter of fact, it's in the DNA of this country that it would take a people from their own country and bring them back and exploit them for their own labor. We must understand that we are up against a very sophisticated war machine and that we must focus on criti critically on thinking about what it means today to have a poor people's campaign. What does that mean? And I will challenge you to think about that. Martin Luther King Jr. noted on his last speech on the war in Vietnam as he opened to address and thank the chairman, he opened with, I come to this great magnificent house of worship today because my conscience leaves me no other choice. I join you in this meeting because I am in deepest agreement with the aims and work of the organization that brought us together, clergy and laymen concerned about Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria. The recent statements of your executive, executive committee, as Dr. King points out, are the sentiments of my own heart. And I found myself in full accord when I read its opening lines, a time comes when silence is betrayal. Well, that time has come for us in relation to Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, man, South Korea, North Korea. Current voices on key issues, and this is taken from the souls of poor folk, right? And I implore you all to read it, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. The Poor People's Campaign, the National Call for Moral Revival, is gathering up tens of thousands of men and women across the country to strategically connect and grow different struggles and lift up the deepening, the deepen and leadership, uh, the leadership of the most affected to transform the political, economic, and moral structures of our society. The campaign will push forward concrete demands, build unity across lines of division, and draw on art, music, and religious traditions to challenge the dominant narrative that blames poor people for its poverty. This multi-year undertaking, beginning this spring on Mother's Day, will be used as a public launching of the campaign by engaging in highly publicized, non-violent, moral fusion direct action. We're not saying civil disobedience. It's, it's non-violent, moral fusion direct action. Over a six-week period in at least 25 states, the District of Columbia during the spring of 2018, this campaign will, will force a serious examination of the enmeshed evils 
of systemic racism, poverty, the war economy, and ecological devastation. At such a time as this, we need a poor people's campaign. So these are some social issues of poverty that flow down from the war economy, and they are. One of the clearest reasons a new poor people's campaign is needed today is the imbalance of spending between the military and social needs. An imbalance that continues 50 years after the 1968 campaign. If the priorities of a nation are evident in this budget, our country has been off course a half a century. At the height of the Vietnam War, more than 40 years ago, when comparative data uh, became available, the United States was spending more than twice as much, along with diverting funds away from social needs and toward the war. The U.S. military is one of the world's biggest polluters, according to a 2014 expose in Newsweek, looking just at military bases in the United States, and I can share a little bit about that when I was uh, stationed on those bases. Um, the Pentagon is directly responsible for 141 Superfund sites, which are contaminated sites so dangerous to human health or the environment that they qualify for special federal cleanup grants. That's about 10% of all Superfund sites, easily more than any other polluter. Another 760 or so additional Superfund sites. Have a safe flight, uh, Jeffrey. Thank you, sir. Okay. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. Jeffrey Sapp. Sites are abandoned military facilities or sites that otherwise support military needs. This previous paragraph was taken from the Institute of Policy Studies, The Souls of Poor Folk, auditing 50 years after the Poor People's Campaign, 1968. So take a look at that. It's on our webpage. And uh, the second half of that audit will be coming out, uh, unveiled in Washington, D.C on April 10. For example, the state of California considers one of the hot spots, is considered one of the hot spots where military poverty is prevalent. Military poverty is prevalent. Other hot spots around the country would be Florida, New York, and Texas. I'm sure military poverty issues have grown. I heard this somewhere in 20 13, from a social policy expert and friend at the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Dennis Colhane. I worked as an intake coordinator in San Diego. During that time, I was completing my master's thesis at Springfield College in Tustin, California. I was exploring and investigating resources and services availability to and for women veterans returning from combat who had and were having a difficult transition after deployment and found themselves, quite like myself many years ago, and Khalil, homeless. I witnessed violations on many fronts in this winter shelter in San Diego that, that deploys 150 men, and we fought for women to go into that shelter. Uh, in San Diego. Let me, let me continue on this thread so you can understand what I'm saying. So during my time at the shelter, I would experience uh, different violations of, on many fronts of the human nature. Veterans who were maimed, crippled, blind from shrapnel, who were given, difficult, uh, given a difficult time through some of the staff. You know how that can be. If they, they would, you know, this is, this, this is why uh, poverty is violence, it's traumatic. They were given a difficult time and sometimes often turned away to go back into the canyons. All right, the, 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 this, this shelter was on uh, a Navy base, it was owned by the government. But if they didn't have a DD-214 form or could not have funds to afford an ID card, they were turned away. Veterans that went off to war and came back. Or much less, like I said, a DD-214 in order to get into this shelter. Fed up, I made that phone call to Dennis Cohane, who was a graduate of Boston College. He's now a big muckety-muck and a friend of mine, one of my white sons, and I'll call him. What's going on, Dennis? He used to organize with us with the Union of the Homeless while he was working on his dissertation. And I participated in helping him at that time. 
When Jackie and I would find ourselves, both with our small children, taking over abandoned buildings, he was there. And I was helping him out with his dissertation. I've helped a lot of people with their dissertation as they interviewed me about my poverty. But yet still, when I get a job and I'm trying to pursue my doctoral degree, I cannot even get paid $15 an hour. But I got to pay for my, my schooling. But yet still, I can't get a, a job and I have all this experience. I can't, I don't get paid but $12 an hour. I'm only a random sample of what's going on in the larger population, right? So I would call Dennis about the basic necessities. The winter shelter that was located on government property owned by the Navy in Point Loma, this is where it was at. As a matter of fact, we started a writing campaign. Actually, I hit it. I was working a night shift and I would go behind the staff's back and, and write up petitions so that the veterans can understand what was going on and we had wrote a petition to demand that Secretary of State Eric Shinseki at the time resign from his post. Get out, because you're not doing anything on the ground to help the veterans. So we did a petition drive secretly. So the city of San Diego during the rainy season and oftentimes during the cold months have to hide their ugly shame from a city that prides itself on their beautiful palm trees and beautiful exotic plants, birds of paradise. So they would hide the veterans behind a tent and a fence, porta parties, just like we would build in bivouac. So it was set up like a military base in the middle of the city. Right across the way was the county, mental health county. So, you know, we were demanding Eric Shinseki on the neglect and abuse, abusive practices and not providing housing to veterans but other, and other services such as mental health options and safe, a safe solitude housing, which is a way, we wanted them to build housing, which is away from the noisy hustle and bustle of city living, which serves as an alternative for those suffering from IED exposure. It's easier for veterans to live in safe solitude so their post-traumatic stress or traumatic brain injury is not triggered, period. You all are experts. I believe there is something like 32 military installations along the California coast. How many are there in the nation? This is just so we can begin to think about this. How many are there in the nation? What basic resources are they willing to supply after returning veterans are deployed back to US soil? This killing machine plans, trains, and equips our sons, daughters, mothers, and fathers for war, and deliberately and violently look the other way when returning veterans, those who have fled urban and poor blighted communities in the first place, return home and are in dire need of social services and cannot receive anything, as if, especially if they had a dishonorable discharge. We have had to fight for these changes on the ground. My master's thesis was on homeless veteran women and the lack of service availability. Homelessness among veterans is on the rise. According to the National Coalition on, on Homeless Veterans, homelessness among women veterans is expected to rise and increasing numbers of w women in the military reintegrating into their com communities as veterans. That's proof, that's empirical data, there's the proof. Increasing to an estimated, um, Okay, women currently make up 8% of the total population and 14.6% of the active duty military, increasing to an estimated 16% by 2035. The number of homeless women veterans has doubled from 1380 fiscal year 2006 to 3,328 in fiscal 2010. While data systems for the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs and U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development do not collect data on the risk factors contributing to female veteran homelessness. Women veterans face unique challenges that increase their susceptibility to homelessness. Within the homeless population, the frequency of mental illness is three to four times higher than the general population with the rate of diagnosis and statistical manual of mental disorders, DSM, diagnosis almost double. Nearly 80% of homeless veterans suffer from mental health disorders, drug, 
alcohol abuse, and co-according disorders. Post-traumatic stress disorder is one of the largest mental health challenges facing returning veterans. From 2004 to 2008, the number of veterans seeking help for post-traumatic stress disorder in the VA system increased from 274,000 to 42,000. Post-traumatic stress disorder and other mental health di disorders lead to difficulties maintaining productive employment, among other difficulties, greatly increasing the risk of homelessness. Now, this is about ur urban communities, this next piece, and the war machine, and then I'll be wrapping up, and, and war machines deployed. Breathe. The military-industrial complex would rather spend tax dollars on waging war in other countries while they, at the same time, wage war on poverty, especially in our urban neighborhoods. For example, the police shooting of Michael Brown in August 2014 in Ferguson, Missouri, was witnessed across the nation, sparking major controversy and unrest as a result of how the shooting was handled and how the neighborhood became a literal war zone. Militarization of police refers to the use of military equipment and tactics by law enforcement officers. This includes the use of armored personnel carriers, assault rifles, submachine guns, flashbang grenades, grenade launchers, sniper rifles, and the special weapons and tactics SWAT teams. Now, I went crazy when I was in Southern California, and I looked at the television. I seen the things unfolding. Uh, in, in Ferguson, especially when they brought the war machines into the neighborhood. And I looked at the sniper sitting on top of that war machine on, on that Hummer. Help me out here, Kaleo. And he was, in, he was on the vehicle wrong. If you're a sniper, they shouldn't see you. So he's driving down with the weapon on top. And, and I said, oh my god, look, at he's supposed to be a sniper. He didn't even have the training with the proper training. And not to talk about the, the, the weapons of war, right? We had to learn to break down the uh, M16 gas-operated weapon in two seconds. You never go into war or go into the military thinking about killing people. But when I saw that weapon, I was like, oh my god, I'm in trouble here. And that's why we need to support those children. Because if we don't support the children within this, they're going, what are they going to have? What are we going to leave them? So I'm not going to go over the rest of that. Okay. We're looking at military spending. You guys know you're the experts. Uh, jobs and health care. My, my youngest son is also a Marine Corps veteran. He was, he's a combat veteran who was stationed in Musaqala, Afghanistan. It was there where he, behind the wire, his eyes were pinned on the video from the field and was the first to witness the video feed to his commanding officers of the strikes and pillages of the veterans. I still cry today. As Reverend Barber says, we need to cry more. We need to, for today's Poor People's Campaign, more than ever before, make the connections to poverty, systemic racism, and ecological devastation beginning with ourselves. For some of us, this work is not just something to do because we have our needs met. Bear in mind, for most of us, this work is life, death, and survival. Every day, people of color must suit up before we leave our homes with the hope of not being stopped by the police or shot by the police. Our constant light of hope should be is that the lighthouses, and I'll leave you with this, the lighthouses of the, of the world shall, should and hopefully steer, steer the wretched souls to a peaceful place away from war. One country at a time, one community at a time, as we struggle to revive the soul of America through a revolution of values, which will shake and shift the moral narrative and redirect our moral compass to transform our plight into a fight that ends war into peace. Thank you for having us. I think a lot of us here, and of course yourself, are aware that because the incredible injustices in this country and the lack of opportunity for low-income um, Americans so many um, African Americans from low income households, Hispanics from low income, whites from low income households go into the military. And then they engage in the kind of violence and militarism that we know about 
um, in the Middle East and, um, and other places. And then they come home and they might become homeless or they might actually engage in some other forms of violence. Is there some way, in your opinion, that we can get those households and those families to refuse to send their sons into the military and to demand instead decent work and decent jobs? Thank you. Forward together, not one step back. This is why we need a poor people's campaign today. Exactly. One household, one community, or one community, one household at a time. This is why we travel together. We have Ann Whithorn here. We also have my brother Khalil and Ann Paul that will do an interactive answering. I don't have to answer all the questions alone because we're not in this to do this alone. I see Lenore, Jackie, we can all interact together. Ann Whithorn is our educational, popular, popular educational and political educational coordinator. These low incomes, our communities, we are hopefully putting together an outreach packet of workshops. Now this is a quiet time of building. As people come in, we are doing reach in, reach out, reach in, and workshops. So hopefully, if you'd like to participate, on uh, advocating for those families. Now remember, when the military comes to your school, when those recruiters come to your school, that's where they get us. But the, you, you gotta understand the washing of the brain and the desperation for the dollar. So they come in and, they, and they're really seductive, yeah. right? So they're very seductive. And for me, it was my way out. I never, you don't go in thinking that, I never went in saying, oh, I'm gonna kill some people of color. I never went in thinking that way. And, and especially when they recruit they educate you. Before you take that oath, you must attend so many educational forums, and they indoctrinate you. So you, you know you're talking about the benefits, and oh, I want to go to college, and I can do all this. I can get away from my community, but little do we know, right? And, and when you go in, you never really know. I was in peacetime, but there were other things that happened to women there, all right? So it's just not the war. There's a, there's a, a you know, Sexual wars, you know, 11% of men that go in are pedophiles, you know, you should watch The Invisible War, you'll see a lot about this, the work that we've done around the DOD and advocating around the, you know, the Department of Justice, the Department of Defense, we've advocated to have certain um, screenings done. We've gone to legislator, legislative hearings, you know, we, so we, we, we put a lot of work in. But again, I hear what you're sta saying, it starts in the communities. Okay. We were doing the job to deflect from those discussions. And why do you want when we have a military say, okay, let's have a national service? Other countries do. Other countries say, if you're a part of this country, you have so many years of service to the country. You can choose military, or you can choose teaching, or you can choose social work. You can choose environmental work. That's the service. What do we call the service in this country? The military is the only thing you have any hope of getting any benefits for. And did we raise that? No, we want to, I mean, I, I blame us left academics, a lot of us in this room are white. That's what this campaign is about. I asked my son why he was choosing to go into the military. I, when I asked my son why was he choosing to go into the military, and he wanted to go in when he was 17, I refused to sign the papers. And he said, Ma, I just don't want to have all that be uh, indebted to uh, student debt. He didn't want to be chained to student debt. Well, I could tell you today, today that he's back home in California attending school in San Francisco. So in the military, he has his GI Bill. So if that was his way out, then that was his way out, right? But there are other things, psychological things that go along with that. Thank you. All right, let's give Sabina another hand. Thank you, guys.